Hi everyone, uh, today is another episode of What Does It Mean? Uh, third episode, and this time we're going to talk about yoga. Uh, what is yoga and what is it to me? So, for a brief outline of the episode, I'm going to define what yoga is, and then talk about the eight limbs of yoga. So stick around if you want to learn more about that. Uh, so yoga. Uh, I wanted to talk about this topic because I discussed it on the previous episode. I just touched on it and said that yoga was a part of my life and that I pra practice it as every day. And I feel that it is important to me to clarify what it is and why I am doing it. Uh, so yoga comes from the Sanskrit word. Uh, yoga, which translates to union, uh, that is the most common translation. Uh, union of what? Union of mind, body and soul. So as I've said on the previous episode, uh, what does it mean to live? To live? Um, we are not really defined by our senses and our physical bodies, uh, ni, nor we are defined by our thoughts and emotions. We are defined by some kind of consciousness or soul, if you want to be more holistic about it. And yoga tries to bring everything together in the present moment. So we've talked about it too. And I've uh, talked about the book The Power of Now of Eckhart Tolle. And yoga tries to bring everything together all at once. That is a broad definition and that is the one I'm going to use today. Uh, another way to clarify maybe a bit is by explaining the concept uh, of activities separated into two groups which are praxis and poiesis. So this is uh, from Aristotle, uh, from Aristotle, the philosopher, the Greek philosopher. Uh, so he separates into two kinds of activities that humans can uh, dabble with. The first one being poiesis. Uh, so the dif main difference is the end goal. So for po poiesis, the end goal is through the fabrication of either an object or a specific goal. For example, uh, pottery is a poiesis activity because it produces pots. Uh, same for paintings, they do paintings. Uh, paintings as in painting, uh, the activity of painting, uh, but also more specific goals like uh, train for a marathon well, the end goal is to run a marathon. Um, and the other kind type of activity activities is praxis. Uh, they are defined by the end goal, their end goal, which are the activity in itself. So what does it, what does it mean? Uh, so essentially is it's the fact that um, the goal of the activity is the activity itself means that the activity is not really trying to produce anything uh, either physically or um, concretely that is not the main objective it is to further uh, the activity in itself. So I'll take examples because I think I'm not really clear about this. So for example, philosophy. Philosophy is a praxis activity because there's no real end to it. You're just enhancing your wisdom, you're trying to understand things, but the more you understand things, well, the more you understand that you know nothing. So that is another philosophical concept. Uh, the more ignorant you think you are, well, 
the more curious you are and you want to try other things. And that is just a self-perpetuating cycle. Uh, often practice activities are cycles that you do and, uh, and you just keep getting better. Uh, another example is exercise. For example, you're not really uh, training for a marathon. You're training to just be healthy and uh, keep your body um, physically fit. And that is a praxis activity because you're not really trying to have a goal. In, you don't have a goal in mind. You're, oh well, the goal is to be fit, to be healthy or to just exercise. And that is an activity that is... I think I'm not that clear for the, in this concept, but yeah, all in all, yoga uh, is a practice activity, if you didn't understand that. Because the goal of yoga is union, union of the body, soul, mind, and the present moment. And it is also the path to it. Because uh, what I'm going to talk about next is what yoga... I don't know if you see this. Uh, yoga is a set of principles and um, practices that will help you go in that way. So I'm going to talk about Ashtanga Yoga, which means eight limbs or eight branches. And these are explained in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is the equivalent of the Bible in yoga. Um, there's a lot of insects right now. Wow. I think those are like baby mus mosquitoes. I don't, I'm not sure, or baby flies. I'm in rice fields and there's a lot of them. Uh, just to say that, so, uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, uh, sacred, sacred, semi-sacred texts, uh, not the only one, but the one of the most important ones because it cle clearly defined what yoga is and how to practice it and this was written around 2000 years ago and yoga has a even longer history it's been practiced for over 5000 years 4000 or 5000 years uh, in the Indus Valley which is India uh, today and the, so, sorry, Ashtanga Yoga. What is Ashtanga Yoga? So there are eight limbs to yoga, and nowadays in the Western countries, uh, we people tend to assimilate yoga to a physical practice which is only one limb that I am going to explain uh, later on. Uh, and yoga is way broader than that. There are a lot of concepts that I am going to explain uh, that define yoga and the physical practice is just one part of it. So let's get into it because I've teased you enough. Uh, so the first limb is called Yama. Uh, yama is a set of principles of moral and ethical guidelines uh, that you can adopt to to develop interconnectedness between yourself and others but also your environment. So it is um, Yamas are principles that you can use in everyday life to contribute to society and to nurture your connection with others and your environment. I'm going to just list, list the yamas right here. Uh, 
you can pause the video to read a bit more about it. Maybe I'm going to do a video where I explain each one of the Yamas. So there are five here. And um, yeah, <laughs> second limb is Niyamas. So it's almost the same as Yamas, uh, as in there are principles that you can use in everyday life. Uh, but yam Niyamas are more centered on oneself, on self-love, self-respect, self-discipline, self-study too. And uh, they are principles to nurture your introspection, to better discover yourself and be more loving towards yourself. It's really a more internally oriented uh, practice uh, in contrast to uh, yamas, which is more externally oriented, oriented uh, where you seek others and also respect the environment. Uh, in contrast, niyamas are more centered on oneself. Uh, once again, I'm going to... So there are five niyamas that I you can see here. And a little definition of each, each niyama. And maybe, as I said before, maybe I'll do a video where I explain a bit more about this. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to give a broad definition of each limb. So the third limb that is maybe the m most famous nowadays that is assimilated to yoga is asana. Asana is the physical part of yoga. Uh, it can be translated to posture, postures. Uh, so they are the positions in which we go into a yoga physical practice. So famous ones like a downward facing dog, for example, or others. And there is actually another translation to asana, which is seat for the mind. So these postures are mm, can be viewed as postures that you take when you want to meditate to take on more meditative aspects of, of yoga. So you just stay in a pose and let your focus be present, being in the present moment. Um, and I feel like uh, the fact that asana has become the face of yoga nowadays tends to discredit all the other limbs which are here, still existent, but people tend to forget that there are the limbs. So let's talk about the others. Uh, the fourth one is pranayama. Uh, prana means, can be translated to life force, and yama is control. So the control of our life force, which is our breath, that connects mind and body. Um, Pranayama is essentially breath work, breath uh, practices, which either can heighten your focus, calm your yourself down, or it's really focused on on your breath, essentially. Next limb is Pratihara, uh, which is the withdrawal of your senses. Essentially, it's um, taking a step back from seeing, hearing, uh, smelling, tasting, touching, uh, and your balance, if you count that as your sixth sense. It's trying to move from your physical body and more into your inner being, uh, either your breath, your heartbeat, and other internal processes like your emotions and thoughts. Pratihara is that. Uh, next limb, so the sixth limb is Dharana, uh, which means to practice focus, uh, concentration. So this is clearly a step before the next limb, uh, which is Dhyana, uh, which is meditation. So the difference is Dharana is more of the practice of 
focus. So you focus on one object, for example, your breath. Uh, so you focus on the inhales and the exhales. You can also focus on a mantra, so a word or a phrase that you repeat and you just repeat, repeat, repeat and you focus on that. Or a location in your body, you can do a bad body scans or just focus on one part. Uh, I'm not going to, deep to dive into it but there are seven chakras um, and you can focus on each chakra or just one. So that is Narana. And dhyana is more of a flow of focus, concentration. Um, so it's the step after dhyana, when you've practiced enough, you can sit sti still or stand still or lay still for a bit longer and be able to really connect your physical and mental parts but also your consciousness so it's really a, it's trying to get into a union of everything and finally the eighth limb is Samadhi which is the culmination of all the others uh, which is bliss or enlightenment so this limb is a bit uh, the end goal uh, because it's when you reach Samadhi that means I, I think that we can say that only a few people have reached this uh, state like the Buddha for example or the Buddhas so some people have uh, say that there, there are several uh, but that is a topic for another video. Uh, maybe I'm going to talk about Buddhism next. No, I don't know. Let's see. But uh, so Samadhi is really that state where you are in union with everything, either internally, externally, and um, in the present moment, of course. So those are the eight limbs of yoga that compose yoga. As you see, there's not... The physical part is just a little part of yoga. It's more about meditative uh, states. And what I wanted to say is the eight, the eight limbs or branches are like of a tree. Um, if you want to make that tree grow, you need to be able to concentrate on all the branches at the same time and not only on one branch because if you focus only on one branch the tree will either collapse or be in, in balance. So that is what I wanted to say about asana or physical part being a bit more prevalent these days that people tend to want to be able to make the best postures or go into headstand, handstand, uh, hand ba arm balances or other twists and they are focused on the physical part of yoga and sometimes this focus can bring you to other aspects of yoga, either concentration, meditation, etc. and that is a good thing. But it can also um, put yourself on blinders, I don't know, uh, the things you put on the horse that do this. So you're only focused on one branch. You're only focused on one branch and you can either injure yourself, have an injury, or not be in the right head space for it, because you focus is good, but too much of it is, is not the best. And so to get back to the tree I was uh, 
giving an image of. You want to be able to grow the tree almost at the same time. I'm talking about, there's so many flies. Uh, I was talking about the physical practice, the focus on it, but it also can be the focus on one of the niyamas, which is svadaya, self-study, uh, which is either the study of oneself or through books, uh, scriptures or texts. And sometimes uh, you can be so absorbed in learning more through text that you forget to practice to practice it in a more not meaningful way but in a more physical way uh, the example that comes to mind is you can read all the how to swim books but if you're not if you don't go into the water you will never know how to really swim you can have all the theories the concept the uh, methodologies, but uh, the methods. But if you don't actually go into the water, I can you say that you know how to swim? It's the same thing for meditation, for yoga, uh, where you can read a lot, but not actually practice it. And that is re really what it means. Actually, uh, dhyana, uh, another translation for it is cultivation, which is that, uh, putting into practice the things that you learn or the things you want to put into practice. And through that, you experience those things by yourself and truly understand them. Excellent. Uh, I think I'm going to end on that because the sun is setting. Maybe I'll film that. <laughs> I don't know if people watch the sunset and or the previous sunrise I put, but that is that is what I do. I love to give you a sense of where I am and what I do. Um, and last thing I wanted to say is I watched Oppenheimer uh, a few days ago, and Oppenheimer quotes the Bhagavad. Vita, which is one of the scriptures in Hindu, Hinduism, and he was, uh, after some research, he actually has learned Sanskrit to be able to read and interpret by himself uh, some scriptures, and as I want to practice yoga in my life, and that is going to be a lifelong journey, I think that um, learning Sanskrit is a good move so I think I'm going to do that to be able to read uh, the Yoga Sutras but also other meaningful texts because Indian culture is really rich and I want to be able to go into that uh, other than that thank you for listening uh, subscribe like comment uh, well there hasn't been really any comments for, till now so <laughs> comment if you watch until now uh, so I know that people are listening to me, but if there's no comment, I'll still I will still continue because uh, I'm beginning to love to do this because it's, it's really a good practice for me to be able to better my speech and do some research on topics that I love. Uh, prepare, well, I haven't really prepared for this either and the more I go into this series the more I want to be able to say meaningful things and so that you can learn things and and be, I, I love to share what I learn along the way and I hope that you do too uh, and that's about all for me thank you namaste namaste means I bow to you I'll show you the sunset.
Wait, maybe I'll put a filter. I think it's going to be better if I put the filter. Okay. It's not focusing. Um, how do I do this? Should we take this down? Yeah. So I'll just let it watch the sunset uh, while I do the meta commentary. Um, I feel like I didn't watch the camera enough and I did a lot of little words like um. Still need to practice that, huh? And maybe try to be able to be more fluid in my talking. Man, there was a lot of flies, huh? Oh, sorry. I should censor myself, no? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, a lot of flies. Or, I don't know, insects that fly it around. Um, yes. Wait. Show you. Oh, there's a big. Uh, kite over here. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah, we can. We can't zoom more, but. Uh, yeah. Did that kite. Fine. Back to the sunset. I don't know if you noticed, but we're back to the same location as the first episode. It's just that I moved uh, to a different place. But uh, yeah, we're here. So I hope the sun sets in one minute because my camera is actually limited to 30 minutes of filming. And I feel like the sun is not going to set in that minute. Well, you, you've seen enough, I think. Not that in like 30 seconds, but the sun is not going to set then. Thank you for listening and see you next week for another topic that I haven't decided on yet. But, uh, see you.